Thank you everyone for joining us for this evening's event. My name is Nick and I'm one of the events hosts here at Powell's Books in Portland, Oregon. Before we begin, I want to encourage you to check out our lineup of upcoming virtual events by visiting our website at pals.com. If you don't already do so, please follow us on social media, um, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. But tonight, we are happy to welcome Cecily Wong and Liz Crane. Cecily is the writer at Atlas, is a writer at Atlas Obscura, the author of the novel Diamond Head and the upcoming novel Kaleidoscope, and her work has appeared in the Wall Street Journal, the LA Review of Books, Self Magazine, Bustle, and elsewhere. The curious minds behind Atlas Obscura now turn their, to the hidden curiosities of food in Gastro Obscura. For Cecily Wong and co-author Dylan Thuris, food becomes a gateway to fascinating stories about human history, science, art, and tradition. Like the first book, all organized by country, lavishly illustrated and full of surprises. Covering all seven continents, Gastro Obscura serves up a loaded plate of incredible ingredients, food adventures, and edible wonders. Uh, Wong will be enjoying in conversation tonight by Liz Crane, the author of The F of Food Lover's Guide to Portland and Dumplings Equal Love, and co-author of the cookbooks Toro Bravo and Hello, My Name is Tasty, as well as Grow Your Own, un Grow Your Own Understanding, Cultivating, and Enjoying Cannabis. She's a longtime writer at, on Pacific Northwest Food and Drink, and her writing has appeared in Sun Magazine, The Progressive, and The Guardian. Uh, this evening's event will include an audience Q&A, so please use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen if you'd like to ask a question. As well, as if someone has typed a question you'd also like to know the answer to, please upvote that particular question by clicking the thumbs up button. Most importantly, consider supporting Cecily and Powell's by purchasing a copy of her new book from us. A link to buy Gastro Obscura along with Cecily and Liz's books will be shared in the chat a couple times tonight. So Cecily and Liz, thank you so much for joining us. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Yeah. What an intro. Um, yes. So wonderful to be here tonight, Liz. Thank you for for being the interviewer. I've been I've been emailing with Liz, so I feel like I already know her. It's the first time I've seen her on video, so it's it's pretty exciting for me. Uh, <laughs> I'm so excited for you. Congratulations. This is amazing. I, Thank you. I so got much. this. Um, early and I've been able to just go through all the different sections and it's so I have all of these lists of like where I want to go and what I want to try and so congratulations I know it's such a huge feat and thank you pages. yeah it's a yeah. it's a fat one it, it yeah. took some doing but yeah I have yeah. the same I have the same list going um, <laughs> yeah uh, so, okay, so I'm going to start by giving a little presentation, um, yeah. a little intro to the book. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to screen share and show you this. Okay, so this is, this is it. This is, um, this is Gastro Obscura. It is, oh, too fast. This is, um, it's a it's a tour around the world through food. It has over 500 entries, but it's it's not just food. We have hidden um, hidden culinary traditions, forgotten histories. We have restaurants that are in places that you would never guess there'd be a restaurant. Just kind of edible wonder of every variety. And one of the best parts about this book is that we, as often as possible, tell you exactly how and where you can try these things for yourself. Um, we, we started writing this book alongside Gastro Obscure, the website, which we launched in 2017. And we just wanted to build this place um, to tell these stories about kind of this wacky, wonderful world of food that we all inhabit. Um, and we wanted to really focus on like the, the obscure and the eccentric and the zany. And so we started gathering stories and foods that had really compelling backstories or histories, um, foods that, that took us on little culinary journeys or, or foods that, um, that were so beloved that like thousands of people would gather to celebrate them. 
And we found this kind of over and over again during our research of this book, um, which leads me to my first entry that I wanted to share. Uh, this is the Spam Jam. This happens um, in Hawaii every year on Oahu. This is a festival that is very close to me. I'm from Hawaii. My whole family is from there. I grew up eating a lot of Spam. And Hawaii is like the... Um, the the heartland of spam we hawaiians eat the most spam in the world they eat like seven million cans of spam a year which is like seven cans a person like including babies it's a ton of spam yeah. so and it's it's very it's very clear through the spam jam 35,000 people come every year to eat tons of spam and all of its glorious multitudes spam fries spam pastries um macadamia nuts with like powdered spam it's it's a delight i've had the pleasure of going to this and i i promise that if you go you will also appreciate spam in a new way um this this next one this is a this is a woman who is getting her her head carved out of a 90 pound block of butter at the <laughs> minnesota state fair uh, this is a tradition that my co-author dylan grew up um attending this is his spam jam um, this she's she's a contestant in a in a competition in Minnesota called Princess Cave the Milky Way. Basically, hundreds of women across the state they they um, apply to to be a part of this competition. They all work in the dairy industry, and Princess K um, becomes the dairy ambassador for Minnesota for the next year. And they choose twelve finalists, and each finalist on each of the twelve days of the Minnesota State Fair sits in this refrigerated glass box and gets her her head carved from a ninety pound block of butter by this professional butter sculptress. And at the end, they they crown a winner, but all of the finalists get to keep their butter head and do whatever they want with it. And so they often throw these huge pancake parties where people can come and slice butter off their heads and, and eat pancakes. The whole thing is really, really just wonderful. Um, this, this, is the, this is the world's only sourdough um, library. And it is, it's in Belgium. It's run by um, the, the world's only sourdough librarian. He, he is this guy, his self-proclaimed mission in life is to collect as many unique sourdough starters as possible. And I think right now he has, he has over a hundred. Um, they're from all over, from China, from Italy, from Hungary. And he, he keeps them alive um, for the biodiversity of bread. And an amazing thing that he does is that he ships in um, flowers and liquids to keep them alive that are from their home bakery, they're from their home country so that they stay as authentic as possible. And he's got some incredible historical sourdough starters. Um, he's got one from the descendants of Yukon coal, um, gold miners, and they used this, this sourdough starter to, to make flapjacks while they were mining for gold. Um, and he's known to give tours if you, if you um, ask him nicely. Uh, this, so this is a fruit, looks like a cranberry. This is actually a miracle berry. This is a fruit from, um, from West Africa and it doesn't taste like much. It's pretty bland, but the magic of the miracle berry is that if you eat it um, and you let the liquid of the flesh coat your mouth, it makes everything that should taste sour, taste sweet. So you eat the miracle berry and then you eat a lemon and it tastes like lemonade or you eat goat cheese and it tastes like cheesecake. And it's a crazy party trick. I just tried this for the first time a couple of weeks ago. You can actually get these freeze dried on the internet and it's just really fun. You eat them, you raid your fridge. Um, they, uh, there's a, there's a, there's a protein called miraculin um, and it, it, it binds to your sweet receptors and it just kind of activates in sour environments. And so all sorts of things that shouldn't taste sweet suddenly do. And it's, I, I also recommend these. Everyone can get these. Um, and can then I, this is, Cecily, can yeah. I just say, I heard, so I heard you on NPR take tasting those and then, um, trying a pickle, eating a pickle and then eating some lemon after. And it sounded so like the lemon tasted like a sugary, sweet candy. It and, was, it was phenomenal. And that was yeah. the first time that I'd tried the miracle berries. Um, I already tried them once before. Oh, they're super fun. And I have a bunch more. And so, um, I'm already lining up new things that I would like to try sour cream. Um, oh, yeah. the list goes on. So cool. <laughs> Thanks. 
So, uh, so this, this is a, this is honey, um, but it is a, it's a special kind of honey. It's called Delhi Ball. It's from Turkey. That Turkish translates to mad honey um, because it can cause hallucinations. It is, um, it's from a very specific rhododendron that grows on, on these very steep cliffs that surround the Black Sea um, in Turkey. And these very special rhododendrons, they contain a very, very special um, neurotoxin that makes um, honey psychedelic. And so in Turkish folk medicine, um, they use it in small amounts to treat kind of um, they, they use it for, for diabetes, for hypertension, for stuff like that. But if you, if you eat more of it, which is, it's actually not even that much. If you eat like more than a tablespoon, that's when, when things start to get a little looser. Um, and this honey, it's, it's an ancient substance. They've been using this um, for centuries. There's even a war story involving this honey. Um, it's 76 BC, the Romans are invading um, what is now Turkey. And King Mithridates and his men are trying to fend them off and they know about um, this mad honey. So what they do is they place the honeycombs along their path, knowing that they're hungry, they're definitely going to eat it. And they do. And of course, they eat a lot. And so it doesn't take long. They all they lose mental, mental, physical capacity. They're all lying on the side of the road. And Mithridates and his men come back and slay them all. And they lost like a thousand men in that battle, um, thanks to Mad Honey. Um, this is also available on the internet. I don't know what the quality is, but I have, I have seen it also for sale. Um, and then this is, okay, so this is, this is the climb to get to the top of Mount Hua in China. Um, it is, it's been called the most dangerous hike in the world by many people. Um, it has been attracting pilgrims for a century. This is a holy mountain. Um, and you have to do this, which is called the plank walk. Um, it's extremely scary. There are planks that are um, mounted to the wall. You have to shimmy across them, use this little chain to guide you. Um, but once you get to the very top, um, there's this, you are 7,000 feet in the air and there is a, there's a Taoist temple and in the Taoist temple is a, a tea house and you can get, um, I don't know, probably the most hard won cup of tea you've ever had in your life with a super, super incredible view. Mm. Um, I, I would love to do this, I think. <laughs> But yeah, so that those are some of my um, some of my favorite selections from Gastro, and I a little sneak peek of what's inside, and I I hope that you find your own favorites, and I'm just very excited to be here talking with you all. So with that, I will stop the share. That was great. It's so fun to just see all of those photos and just sort of like we're, we were all traveling together for a little bit yeah no it is nice the photos definitely help yeah. um yeah so I feel like it's definitely like it's it's not ideal to have to do virtual events although these ones with Powell's are pretty great but it is like kind of nice that your book has come out at a time when like travel is so greatly reduced for so many people and you mentioned like, so are, do you just have like, as you were working on this, was it four years that it took? That yes, it was, it was four years. We started in 2017. A, yep. Yeah. Such a long project. I'm sure that like, did you track, first of all, did you travel to any of these places? And you have this long list of places now that you want to go as a result? Yes. I mean, the list of places I want to go is enormous. We did yeah. get to do some traveling um, in the pursuit of eating while writing this book. Nice. Um, one of one of the best trips I got to go on was to the country of Georgia. And that was so cool. I mean, just a, just a food culture that I was wholly unfamiliar with. And what a beautiful food culture. They had this whole tradition of feasting um, called supras. And the way they fill the table is just, I've never seen it before. They don't 
they, they do it in courses, but they don't clear the plates in between the courses. They stack them so that you can physically see how much you've been eating. And so they call it like a two story, a three story, a four story Supra. Um, and so there's that. And then there's this guy who, who presides over every Supra. He's the toast master. It's called the Tamata. And it's, it's usually a guy these days, they're kind of introducing more women, but, um, he stands up and he toasts like a dozen times throughout the meal. And it's at a traditional order where, you know, first you, you toast to the country, you toast to the children, you toast to the people you want to remember. Um, and it's just, it was, it was such a beautiful thing. Um, and then they had amazing wine. It was, it was a really great experience. So those three entries are the ones in the book. Oh, um, I love that. <laughs> That's so, so, and like, was that at the, toward the beginning of the project or in the middle or towards the, when did that, that, come? that was probably a year in, we were working, yeah. we were just about yeah. to work on Europe. And so that seems like a good time. Like it's a good congratulatory, like you've gotten this far now you get to travel. It did. It did <laughs> help as a treat. Yeah. Um, so what was the like process of putting this together and just curious how you like divvied up with with your co-author co-founder of Atlas Obscura Dylan Thuris like how did you two did you sit down and just kind of come both come up with your lists and then decide how to tackle it from there yeah no this was um it, it was largely freestyle you know we got a lot of we got a lot of um latitude when it came to making decisions about this book, which was really fun, but we had a whole yeah. team. Um, Gastro Obscura, the website has this, has a whole edit team with writers, with fellows, yeah. um, you know, freelance writers, and then this whole community that writes in every day from around the world saying, eat this thing. I tried this thing. It's awesome. You know, and then we yeah. do a little more digging into it and fill it out. Um, and so a lot of it, probably half of it came through that, either through um, you know, the, the edit team or a community member, and then we just chased it a little further. And then yeah. the other half, um, yes, came from, from Dylan and I over four years, just, just kind of, we, we moved across the world. We went, um, we went continent by continent and then country by country within it. And you know, we left some holes, but the great thing was that while we were writing this book, um, there were also, you know, building the website. And so you never knew when something like cool and exciting would come in and we'd be like, oh my God, we have to put that in. Um, but we had a weekly meeting, the whole team got together and we would just bring the best of the week together and then we would just argue. <laughs> you had to sort of state your case for certain things. And yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So I imagine like during this process, so you mentioned like your trip to Georgia, but also like, I'm sure that like you tried a lot of these foods. I mean, some of them are just, would be so hard to get to try um, unless you went there, like that um, bluefin tuna heart. It's like, it's dried and then used like batarga. I want yes. to try that. I really want to try that. But like, what are some of the, you know, new to you foods and drinks that you got to sample while putting it together? Yes, uh, you know, going through it, it is it's set up like a travel book. But what's great about this book is that it, so the how to try it. So we put at the end of each entry, we try and put it in wherever they're from. So if it's a Chinese dish, we tell you where in China you can try it. But the beauty of the book um, is that you can try a lot of these dishes wherever you are, and that's a wonderful thing that I found about living in Portland is there are so many foods from the book that are available at, at restaurants, you know, just so close by. And so just here, I've had a number of things. There's this, um, I've had a, a roja mo, which is the, the, world's, the world's first sandwich from China. They have that at Dan Wei Kinting. Um, and I've had herring under a fur coat, which is a layered um, Russian salad that they have at Kochka. Um, they, there's, there's so many, there, there, there's amazing plate lunch, um, Hawaiian plate lunch in Portland. There's an entry on that in the book. And I was, I was living in New York for, for like 13 years. And one thing that there's like a huge, huge lack of is Hawaiian plate lunch. Couldn't find it anywhere. Um, and now that I'm here, it's, 
it's everywhere and it's fantastic. And so that's yeah. been like a great pleasure for me. Um, but yeah, I was surprised while going through the book this last um, past that I've eaten a lot of the foods, but a lot of them, um, you know, not not in their native countries necessarily, but but here. Yeah. I There were several things that I've tried, but vast majority things that I'd never tried and or never heard of. And I like that it's so storied because it's not like, it's not like sensational or shock value, like, well, look at this. There are wild things in the book, but it's, you're getting to the, the history and the culture and, and how these dishes came to be. So it's like um, really stimulating in that way. And like, that's what makes you want, that's what makes me want to travel somewhere is like getting that, those stories behind everything. Well, thank you for saying that. We tried very hard to, to really make it about the storytelling. I'm coming to this book mostly as a novelist. And so I, I'm really invested in, in the stories and the histories. And um, that's kind of the narrative side of all these foods, which is, is what made me so interested. I mean, the, the cured tuna heart that you were talking about, yeah. we came to that from, we started with that, I think. And then we were thinking, you know, why are they eating cured tuna heart? And then we realized that Italy on the Mediterranean was this huge bluefin tuna route um, back during, during Roman times. And so they would, they would catch all these tunas and they would, you know, once a year, and then they'd have to use every part of the, of the fish and, and dry the heart, preserve it. And then we got into, um, we learned about Roman fish sauce, garum, and which was the original fish sauce, which we think of, or I always thought of as um, a Southeast Asian condiment, learned that it was originally a Roman condiment. And then we, we looked into all these garum factories that were along the Roman empire that spread as far to the Black Sea. And so writing this book was kind of just like opening, each thing was just like a can of worms that we just followed until we couldn't follow it anymore. And, and that was fun. So now we have a, we have a double page spread of, of fish sauce factories of the Roman empire. And we have the entry on the, on the cured tuna and you know all of these things that made just make me think about how you use a, a tuna in a, in a completely different way, um, yeah. even historically. Some of the sections that I really liked were the, like on this island off of France, there's an oyster vending machine. I was like, I want an oyster vending machine. And then in Texas, the pecan pie vending machine. Um, and that's a way of leading us to, uh, in a month, you're gonna be, we get to do another event together at Portland Book Festival. And there's gonna be this crazy vending machine that's gonna be there like for the book, right? Yes, we they they put together a gastro obscura vending machine. I have not seen it in person yet. I'm super yeah. excited. They're sending it to they're sending it to Portland for the book festival. It's gonna be filled with foods from the book. Um oh gosh. really, yeah. you know, hard to find foods. It's kind of a surprise to me as well, exactly what's gonna be in there. I know of a few yeah. items, um, but yeah, you know, we couldn't go on tour this year, so we sent the vending machine on tour. And we're yeah. meeting the vending machine in different locations. It's a so exciting. Yeah. And today it's in Union Square. You said it earlier. That's yes. The, yeah. It's in Union Square. It's a company. Dylan was there today, my co-author, but he was also there with a woman who plays um, fruits and vegetables as instruments, as musical instruments. Mm -hmm. And then there's also a woman who is making cotton candy on edible flowers. Oh, the cotton candy is, it is around the flowers. Yeah. So oh, you can cool. eat the whole thing. Yeah. Fun. So I kind of want to move toward, if you don't mind the Oregon section in the book, cause I love that one. And I'm wondering, when did you move to Portland? You mentioned growing up in Hawaii and then New York. And then when did you here. So I, I grew up in Oregon. I'm, oh. I, grew, I, I came to a, um, Eugene with my family when I was seven. And so I was okay. born in Hawaii, but I was raised in Oregon. And yeah. then I left um, after high school to go to school in New York. And I, I, um, I stayed for, for a long time. And then I came back this, this last year. It's been, I just, it's been one year as of, as of last month. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. That's an, poof. What an unusual time to move here. <laughs> a, tr a, a truly yeah. unusual time, yeah. but uh, 
such a blessing. Like I'm yeah. so happy to be here. Um, sure. It's been, it's been wonderful. Portland is an awesome place. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. So the mushroom. Yeah. So I, like, <laughs> I had never, and I love mushrooms and I forage for mushrooms. I'd never heard of the humongous fungus among us that you know it, it we it's the largest organism in the world living it, organism in the world it, it it sure is you know it makes me feel better that you'd never heard of it either mm-hmm. um i we we bumped into this humongous fungus while we were researching and finding things for oregon and yeah. i actually i i admitted this to liz over email but i have a strange phobia of mushrooms growing in the wild. I, I love to eat them. I will eat any mushroom, but something about seeing them growing makes me kind of nervous. So mm-hmm. putting together, putting together the spread was, um, was, was not super easy for me, but we, but once we ran into the humongous fungus, uh, which is exactly the largest living organism in the world, we, I mean, we couldn't deny the fungus. It had to go yeah. in. It had to be the organ entry. So yeah, this fungus is enormous. It covers like, I think it's three square miles. It's like 35,000 tons, which is the equivalent of 200 gray whales. Like I can't even fathom yeah, how large this is. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but neither, but no one really knew how big it was. It was only recently that they realized how, how much this had spread because this mushroom is mostly growing underground, like a meter underground. And so it was only by taking a sample of a mushroom that was, um, over here, you know, then taking another sample of a mushroom that was way across over here and being like, this is the same mushroom that they realized, you know, the actual girth of this, of this mushroom. Yeah. And I, and so I like that you had that one because that was the one that just, I was like, that was the showstopper. I'm like, what the heck? I never <laughs> heard of it. But then you have all these other like mushrooms that you've heard of, maybe not, but like they're more common. And in, in when you think of edible mushrooms and so that honey mushroom, it's edible, but I guess it sounds like it's maybe not that tasty. It sounds like it's not the best mushroom, but yeah. it's totally edible. And what, I think we should eat it. Like, I really, I really yeah. think that that is the solution. Like there's, there's such a history of eating, you know, like pests because yeah. apparently this mushroom, you know, it, 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 um, it sucks nutrients from conifer trees. And so it's killing trees. And so, you know, people are like, we got to get this mushroom under control. So I, I think that I, I Googled it. There's plenty of, there's plenty of recipes for honey mushrooms. Yeah. And after I read that, so this is like, I feel like it is similar, like to the encyclopedia set in my basement growing up. Like I read a section and then I read the adjacent sections. And then before I know it, it's like really late and I have to go to bed, that kind of feeling. But like I read that and then I watched, I think it was OPB field guide. They had a whole, some, some program that was a local, you know, PBS, um, program on it. And yeah, they were like trying to dig all these trenches, like dig their way out of this life force sapping because it's just like attacking the roots of these trees and so they want to but yeah oh maybe we should just cook have a big maybe we should start a honey mushroom festival Culinary challenge festival. challenge accepted I think yeah. that if there was <laughs> if there was ever a state yeah. to to embrace eating the 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 humongous fungus yeah do you have a favorite mushroom to forage for morels yeah, I have a group of friends that we, they're all like in natural resources in Washington or Oregon, and they kind of track the burns every year. And oh my gosh, I just think they, I love foraging for them because of the way they look. They're so unique and that like conical little, the way they come up out of the duff. But um, I also just, they're my favorite to eat. So they're also, that that makes them my favorite to get. <laughs> they're so they're good. They're also my favorite. I mean, they are perfect. Um, they really are. And they're like, I understand that idea of like mushrooms being a little bit freaky deaky in the wild. Cause it's like these forms that grow so quickly, but I feel like morels are just beautiful. Like they just have this, they're kind of like little elven creatures the way they're like little conical heads. I think I could probably do it. That could be like a gateway mushroom yeah. To, yeah. to more foraging. Right. Um, so I have a bunch of questions. I know I won't get to all of them because we do have to do um, other folks' questions, but it is, so you have a novel that's coming out soon too, and you're a fiction writer. You've had 
you write fiction primarily, right? Or maybe half and half. But how is it like switching back and forth between nonfiction and fiction for you? Yeah, no, I am I am primarily a fiction writer. I came yeah. to this project as as a novelist, um, but yeah. I, I come from a food family. Um, I grew up in the kitchen. My parents had um, had three restaurants while I was growing up, and so I grew up in the kitchen, always around food very enthusiastic eater, always traveling for food. And so food was always this kind of like background to everything that I did. And yeah. so, yeah. So when I saw that they were launching gastro, it just, um, it called to me and, and, and they really wanted to approach, um, food writing and food reporting um, from a storytelling point of view. They really wanted to focus on the narrative side. And so, um, and so they brought me on and, and it's, it, it's been interesting because it's the, it's really the first time that I, that I've done um, this level of food writing and it, it was, it was great. I mean, it, it was, I wrote, I wrote this book alongside my second novel um, uh -huh. and, and it, it was nice and that I got to have separate days to do each thing. So kind of like toggle back and forth between between the the different types, but I feel like the writing each kind of taught me um, something new about the other one. I became a really brutal editor um, mm. writing the gastro book because a lot of the entries um, started off as these three thousand word articles, and then they just yeah. had to get trimmed into um, 250, 300 words. And so it just became about distilling the essence of, of what was most compelling about each one of these foods or restaurants or traditions. Um, and so I got to kind of take that eye to my own work and, and just start chopping, but it's nice. It's, it's a great way to just kind of like figure out how to just get to the heart of it and, and, and start your story. Yeah. 500 times. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That's, I mean, like, yeah, 3000 down to 300. That's just like, oof, that's hard. Yeah. It, it takes a few passes. Yeah. <laughs> and then when you think, so, so now you're in like the celebratory mode and the book is out there and I'm sure you're exhausted and excited and so many different emotions around it. But like, if you can take a look back at like the last four years of putting it together, like what was, were one or two of your like favorite parts of it? Maybe that trip to Georgia, maybe try, like a couple of your very, very favorite parts. Yeah, no, I, it's been a lot of, um, you know, it was a four year journey and we're looking over yeah. our shoulders as a team. And it was, it was, it was a huge team effort. We had a really fun team. And when we were in the office all together, we got to eat a lot of foods together. Someone yeah. was always going on a trip, bringing things back. Um, our deputy editor went to Iran, he brought back the best cotton candy ever, Iranian cotton candy, Pashmak is so good. Um, we all got to eat a little bit of that. Um, I got to go to Sardinia, I brought back Botarga. We all ate that at like nine in the morning, way too early. Um, but if there was ever a team that was like down to eat Botarga at nine in the morning, it, it was them. Um, <laughs> one day we all did, there's something called a Tim Tam Slam. Um, a Tim Tam is a type of, of, of cookie. It's an Australian cookie. And if you bite it in a certain way, it's cream filled and you pull hot liquid through it, it becomes a straw, just a very temporary straw. It yeah. falls apart like almost immediately. Um, but that's called a Tim Tam slam. And so we all had a lunch where we got a pack of Tim Tam. So I'll try to slam together. So, you know, um, we got to do like that kind of stuff yeah. pretty much daily. One day someone brought in a cheesecake made by nuns. It was just like kind of like a regular rotation of wacky foods. So I definitely miss, you know, just the pace of what we got to eat while we were really building this out. Yeah. And that cotton candy looked, so I'd never heard of that. And it's so unusual looking because it's like striated, right? It's sort of yes. like it's long threads. Yes. And what, what does it like taste like and feel like when you eat it? <sighs> It's kind of, this sounds probably not appetizing, but it's got kind of a flower flavor. Um, it's, it's made with, with a, with a flower and sugar and, and it gets hot and like it a, starts like a blooming dough. flower or like a flower um, dough. Flower dough. Oh yeah. Oh, no, 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 okay. Flower yeah, dough. Yeah. yeah. Like a milled flower. Yep. Yeah. And, yeah. um, 
instead of being spun like our cotton candy, it starts as a dough and it gets pulled. And so mm-hmm. it, it just gets long and wispy. And then it's got this very deep kind of complex nutty flavor. I think they toast the grains as well. And so it's got kind of a sweet savory thing going on, whereas our cotton candy is just sweet. Um, and so it was, it was like a very sophisticated cotton candy. I hope that that's in the um, Portland Book Festival vending machine. Yeah, I want to try that. I would also like that to be. Yeah. I'll, I'll try and I'll put in a request. Yeah, please do. Um, so I think I got all of the must ask questions. So I think I'll go into the um, the audience questions. Does that sound good? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, let's see what we got here. Um. All right, so coming in from Miriam, did you, Cecily, like everything that you ate? Um, And if something didn't taste good to you, like, was it Nick's? Like, did you not include it? Or like, how was that process? Um, You know, for the most part, I liked everything I ate. (laughs) I'm gonna, I'm gonna say it. I liked most things. Um, There's even, there's this liquor um, that, that they drink in Chicago called Jepson's Malort. It was made by this Swedish immigrant who was like a heavy smoker and couldn't taste anything. He made this liquor and it tastes terrible. Even the people who make the liquor say that it tastes terrible and you probably won't like it. Um, I I thought it was pretty, I thought it was fine. You know, yeah. like I, it wasn't, it wasn't a big, and, and that's, you know, one of like, that's an example of a, of a food that has, a story that I find compelling that, you know, he couldn't, they, during prohibition, they, they let him sell it because they couldn't imagine that anyone would be drinking this for pleasure. They figured it was medicinal. Um, and so they still, yeah. they still sell it to this day. Um, we also, we also try to blood candy, um, that they used to distribute, um, in the Soviet union to children, um, who needed a nutritional supplement and, that wasn't great. It did taste a bit like blood. It's got powdered cow's blood in it, but it was, it was perfectly fine. It tasted like a Tootsie roll with a hint of blood. And, and that's in the book. Yeah. Intrepid eater, a Tootsie roll <laughs> with a hint of blood. Soft. Not bad. Are you going to hand those out for Halloween this year? I, you know, maybe I should try and become the most hated house in all of Portland, or maybe yeah. no one will have anemia, you know, in Portland ever again. Yeah, could be a plus to that. Um, okay, so the next question is, um, how many of these places have you visited personally in the book? And what are some of your um, favorite foods? We talked talked about some of that, but yeah. Um, I I don't know of the places. Um, fewer of the places yeah. where you have to physically get on a plane and go there. Those are on the list um, yeah. that I that I hope to get to. Um, yeah. I, I think that I probably had at least half of the foods in the book. Wow. That's um, a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, we we're at it for four years and yeah. research. Um, and so I don't know. I mean, there, there are so, I, I like so many of them. I don't really know. I don't know how to choose. Um, yeah. Everything from Hawaii is close to me. Everything that we ate yeah. in Georgia, phenomenal. Um, a lot of stuff. What, what's funny is that the States was actually one of the harder sections to put together. Um, yeah. There's a lot of food in the States that I still have to try. We were talking before, because I'm from Cincinnati, about the pawpaw, because that's the Ohio entry. And I tried it once at the Ohio State Fair. But that one, when you go for your book event, Cecily's going to do a book event in Columbus and then also in like a month in Seattle, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so when you go to the Columbus one, maybe you'll try some papa when you're out there I think they're in season right now um I was just on an event and two people brought out papas they had them in their fridge oh like a and, virtual event yeah exactly, okay. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they didn't bring papas to to the restaurant yeah. although that would have been welcome but you yeah. tried them so what did the papas taste like um it was I was in high school and I honestly I feel like it was like a, the tiniest bite of it on its own, but like custardy and a little bit tropical, a little bit mangoey. 
Um, but mostly they just had this like fluffy cake that I ate it in. So then, you know, it was like a sugary cake, but, but it was good. And I would love to, they're the, I read in the book, they're the largest, um, edible fruit in North America. Is that right? I, I, I believe that is correct. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Pretty cool. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's see what else we have in here. Um, got a lot of like, yay, thank you, and um, less questions. So I'm going to find a, um, oh, okay. So do you list any sources for these foods online that like where you can find things um, in the US, like in the, in the book or on the website or like a source like where thing? To, where to find them, where to source them to eat them. Yes, to get so, the different foods and drinks. Yes. So there, there is one suggestion at the end of each entry. Um, if that is not convenient because it's in a place that we can't currently get to, or you have to go there. If you look online at the gastroobscura database, uh, there's usually some of the entries are only in the book. A lot of them are also online and online underneath our users can submit more places where you can find them. So you might find yeah you know, a, an entry with, you know, Papa's where it'll tell you, you know, three other state fairs that also have Papa's or a farmer's market or whatever it is. Um, and so it'll be, it might be closer to you. There might be an online source. And so that's a good place to start. Um, and then there's just, there's the good old Google machine. That's how I've sourced a lot of things. We just, um, we sourced a bottle of this this King's ginger um, liquor, which we um, we sampled on, on the radio and this was this was pretty hard to track down and we finally found it it's it's essentially it's a it's a liquor that was created for king edward the seventh um for him to drink while he went on these these long drives in his car and his the royal physician wanted to keep him warm and so he made a a liquor of brandy and honey and lemon um and ginger um to you know keep him keep them vital and so yeah. now they make this before for a long time it was only for royals but now they're making a, a special king's ginger that they distribute to non-royals and mm -hmm. um there was nothing n near me but astor wines and spirits in new york will will ship it to you yeah so did you have you have it now i have it now yeah. it is delicious I, also on that npr I, I got to hear about that on that segment that you did that was fun that you was on it with yeah Yes, that one's very good. If you if you if you find the king's ginger, buy the king's yeah. ginger. I want to get some. I just remembered one thing that before we started the event that we talked about um, was that really wild like champagne as energy drink. Yes. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, I mean, this is yeah. I will talk about this to anyone. This is one of yeah. my favorite stories, um, yeah. which is just I mean, that's the thesis. They used to give champagne as an energy drink to athletes, to actual at to Olympians um, there. The 1908 London Marathon, I think it's like 55 runners started and only like 27 of them crossed the finish line because so many of them were drunk. Um, and there was there was just a time which was not that long ago until about like the mid 20th century that people thought that that alcohol was more hydrating than water. And so they would give athletes um, champagne, they would give them brandy to to gargle with while they were running. And so the front runner of the of the London Olympic Marathon, it uh, it was a really hot day. He got super hot and he accepted champagne and he, he was out, he passed out. And then someone else took the lead, got like a four mile lead, also got tired, obviously needed probably water, um, went for champagne as well, dropped out, wasn't going to work. And then the, the guy who ended up crossing the finish line also drank a lot, was quite drunk. By the time he finished the, by the time he crossed the finish line he'd had his heart massaged he'd ran the he, he ran the wrong direction um he actually had to be he had to be helped across the finish line so they ended up taking his medal away giving it to the second place runner um and it's just it's wild and they kept doing it they kept giving champagne to runners in the, in the even the paris games 1924 they stocked the rehydration stations with wine dang I know, just <laughs> beautiful, glorious, absurd. Yeah. yeah. 
so bizarre. Um, okay, I'm gonna go back in here because there's a whole bunch more. So I just wanted to ask you that though, because I remember we talked about. Thanks for um, giving me that opportunity. <laughs> yeah, it's so wild. Um, mom, 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 mom. There was one that I just saw that I wanted to. I don't know where it went, but um, are there any good, you did mention Kachka and Donway Canting. Are there any good Portland restaurants which serve um, new interesting food that you can recommend? I assume they, that Daniel means like maybe something that's in the book. Um, yeah, so those were the top ones. There's also, yeah. um, there is a, there's a cider company. I want to say they're in Hood River and they make a Basque style cider. Um, there's there's a cider in the book that's very similar um, from from Astorias and it's it's a naturally fermented cider um, and and the the interesting part about it is because it's natural it's there's there's a small amount of of effervescence and so the effervescence comes from um, the way they pour it which is this like very very long pour from from feet above your head into a small glass um and and so they make they make that here in Bend and I found I think it's called Son of Man um and I I found that at New Seasons yeah which is and also um Nat West Reverend Nat's Hard Cider they do that too I don't think that he has that cedra like canned or bottled but at the cider you can get it yeah, oh, it's cool. super funky and yes, um, a lot barnyard of flavors. Like yes, <laughs> yeah, totally. Yes, well, that's great. Um, oh, can anyone go? So this person, uh, anonymous, is asking, can they go see the or the honey mushroom? Is that something they can go and? I, I would I would imagine you could definitely see it. I mean, yeah. it's it's spread it's spread over three square miles and so yeah. yeah I mean basically there's just you know the 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 little parts that are that are sprouting from I mean I don't think they're that little but they are the, the above ground parts and so I'm not sure it's really going to look like anything um much more than a mushroom but but the idea that you are visiting the largest living organism on earth is still pretty exciting yeah yeah, I think either, I think that in that program that I watched, yeah, they said that like, it's one time a year when they actually show, but then like most of the year you don't, it's like all this, like, yeah, like that web underground. It's so That's interesting. I, it's so cool to learn about that humongous fungus among yeah. us. Thank maybe you I'll, maybe I'll try and watch that documentary and I'll send you the, ease my way I into it. it. The old guide, but I don't, yeah. Um, what food did you not get a chance to try, but you really would like to try in the future? Asked Terry. Oh, there, there are so many. There's yeah. one, there's one that I, that I'm, that I really need to try, um, before, um, while it still exists, which is, it, it's a pasta on the island of Sardinia, the Italian island of Sardinia. It's considered by many to be the rarest pasta in the world because only, I think it's three women right now know how to make it. Um, it's been passed down through the same Sardinian family um, for 300 years, and they make it for two feasts. Um, you can only eat it during these two feasts, and it's, it's called Threads of God, and it's a it's a pulled pasta. So it starts with um, it starts with dough, and you just pull it, pull it, pull it, double it over until you have these really, really wispy, kind of impossibly thin strands. Um, and they do it all by hand and they dry it um, and they serve it to, to pilgrims during this biannual feast um, in which they walk, I want to say 20 miles overnight. They end up at this sanctuary. They all have this meal together of this mm -hmm. dying pasta art. Um, it just yeah. seems like such a, like a wonderful experience that, you know, you never know how long it's going to last if, you know, the next generation of, of women in this family are going to want to learn it. And so the, the matriarch of this family is actually, she has, she's been making videos of herself making it just in case it does die out. But like, it's just, you know, who knows if it'll be the same. Oh my gosh, that sounds, yeah, I would love to try. I would love to go to any of those islands. Sardinia, Corsica, that whole area. I've always wanted to. 
Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. No, the eating is, it's, it's so different from, from yeah. the, the continent. Yeah. So what it reminded me just, I think of when you said like the, the, just your hand motions reminded me of that, like the spit roasted bread. Yes. That's like popular, this one particular one in Lithuania, yes. that the photo of it is so like, I'm like, that's bread. It's these like spiky spit roasted and they just keep adding like wet batter and dough to it. And it just slowly bakes and, and turns. Did you try that one? Uh, yes, actually. Someone <gasps> brought that in. Oh, cool. Yep. Someone went to Romania and brought it in. Delicious. Yeah. Um, you know, it survived a, a transatlantic flight, but, but it was still super good. And, yeah. and it's everywhere, you know, it's like, it's like a very common style of cake yeah. there, but for us, it's just like, we, I've never seen a, a spit roasted cake. Yeah. I kind of wanted to bring up the, but I can't remember what page it's on. Okay. Let's see what else we, um, I got that one. Uh, oh, that's a good one. I, I didn't bring that up and I meant to. Are there any recipes in the book? There, there are a handful of recipes. Yeah. It's definitely not a, it's definitely not a recipe book. Um, yeah. And the recipes are quirky. Um, so there's, there's a recipe for, for um, Bude Jjigae, which is a, it's army based stew. It's a South Korean recipe. Um, and this, this, is it goes back to my beloved spam it's a it's basically there's a there's a history behind the stew which is that um during the korean war there there wasn't a lot of meat in the country a lot of south koreans were really hungry and and the meat that was available um was at the army base the 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 american army base and so civilians would line up for the soldiers leftovers they would take whatever they could find and what they found a lot of was you know kind of canned americana so spam hot dogs canned beans american cheese and so they created this stew called army based stew kimchi um gochujang instant noodles and it's still this like super beloved dish today there are fancy restaurants in in seoul that that exclusively serve this dish it's a it's become a comfort food and um it's it's really good it's 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 salty and it's intense it's not a food you can eat every day have you had it I haven't but I kind of it's like I kind of make something like that at my writing studio a lot not, I mean, just with, I use the certain type of noodles and this, lots of the similar ingredients, but no, I would love to try. I want to make, so the rest that recipe is in here. Yeah, it's, it's in there. Um, yeah. yeah, no, but exactly. It's kind of the, the, the recipe of this is something probably similar that lots of people are making, you know, like it's, uh, yeah. it's what you have in your kitchen and yeah. ramen and this is kind of a Korean style but yeah this this recipe just happens to have a really you know cool cool tragic but also you know very yeah. compelling history yeah um yeah what else do we have we have a recipe for Finnish um I think it's Finnish mustard um it's a it's a mustard to eat with um sauna sausage which is a sausage that you eat exclusively in the sauna um which wow. you know is also something that I would love to do yeah there is a pimento cheese some sort of recipe too I remember. ah yes I thank you cheese. yeah I also love pimento cheese this is another thing where they have a very special pimento cheese sandwich at the at the master's tournament the golf tournament and there's this whole scandal about what the original recipe was They've been trying to recreate this original pimento cheese that everyone associates with the master's tournament. It was lost for a long time. They okay. kept changing caterers. Um, and then there was this woman, this hero who had been saving a sample of pimento cheese in her freezer for a year. She came forth with it. They sampled it. You know, they're kind of trying to reverse engineer this pimento cheese. Um, yeah. And so this recipe is um, from the junior league and they, they say it's very close to to yeah. the original so <laughs> yeah so yeah there are recipes there's not a lot it's but there are some really fun like I I want to make all of them they all sound delicious well winter, winter is coming I know yeah 
Um, let's see, let's do one more question here. We've got, we answered that one. Um, well, this is a question you've answered, but I mean, it's, it's good to answer it again um, in a different way. Like, how did you learn of all of these gastronomic oddities and delights? Like, how, how did you find out about them and, and how did they kind of come to your all awareness? Sure. Yeah. I mean, exactly. So it, it was a huge lift from, from community members. Um, yeah. There were so many regions in the world where we would have had a really hard time, um, you know, figuring out what was, what was there. And, yeah. um, and we had a lot of people help us out. There's this, um, this desert truffle market in, in, Kuwait, I want to say, and we spent yeah. months trying to figure out where this desert truffle market was. It became oh. one of our, you know, one of our hard things to track down. And so we would always, we'd have to find someone who um, was familiar with the region to, you know, to to make some calls or to to physically go there or if they were near. And so we had we had some support on the ground when we found little, you know, whiffs of things on the internet that we that we wanted to chase down. Um, and so sometimes there was enough um, that we bumped into and kind of cobbled together ourselves, watching, watching videos, reading blogs, reading articles where we could, you know, put it together ourselves. But then we also had, you know, team of freelancers, team of editors, team of really talented writers who, who did a lot of um, sleuthing and, and research for us. Yeah. And it is like it, for anyone, I feel like most people have are aware of the website and the social media, but like I, I'm from Cincinnati and I got to learn on the website about this place that I've never been to there, which is this really beautiful in our old like Union Station, um, this uh, ice cream shop. It's Grater's ice cream, but it has all of this beautiful, these beautiful ceramics in it. But anyway, like that's like get the book and then also like use the companion of having the, the web because there's a lot of entries that are not you know that are only in the book and that are only on the web yeah exactly exactly yeah, yeah there's there's way more online so whenever yeah. whenever I hit up a new place I always check out you know see what's see what's there it's yeah. usually pretty surprising even yeah. for me yeah Um, okay, last question. Was there any entry that had a, con we'll, we'll end on drama, that had a contentious background that took some time to like really tease out the history? Something that was just sort of uh, difficult. Well, you did just talk about, yeah. I mean, definitely, you know, yeah. whether they're gonna, yeah, there's lots of things. I mean, yeah. um, there are a lot of things in the world that are that are natural resources that we that we had to think um, a little hard about whether or not we wanted to include them because things like um, caterpillar fungus or um, edible birds nests you know they have this kind of um, folklore type mystique medicinal um, reputation that keeps people buying them even though sometimes it puts um, whoever's harvesting its life in danger. Um, it creates you know tensions within communities who are trying to build a livelihood around it um, and, and the prices fluctuate, you know, kind of feast or famine, um, or just things that you don't want to go extinct. And so um, there, there were items like that where we had to um, we had to tread kind of carefully. Um, and decide whether or not, um, and, and look a little deeper and, and decide whether or not it was, it was a worthy thing to, to kind of draw attention to. Yeah, it's hard work. It's a lot, yeah, a lot at stake. Yeah, so there are a few of those, but we tried to do it responsibly. Yeah. Huh. Hi. Excellent. Hey, yeah, well, thank you. <laughs> thank you for all of that. Um, yeah, and thank you for, for, this and yes, um, so everyone, this is the book. Please go, uh, please go, please consider purchasing a copy of this. Uh, go, you can go to powells.com on the link there and get a great copy of this whole book we've been talking about here. So 
also also Liz's book here this one oh. too so yes <laughs> and, and other books so um thank you uh thank you both so much for joining us and thanks for that conversation and that presentation and all that it was wonderful and um and also thank to all you out, out there for tuning in tonight and uh so um please go on and check out our upcoming virtual events on pals.com and yeah we look forward to seeing you all at another one and yeah well, thank you, everyone, and have a good night. Thank you so much for having me. This was great. Thanks, Liz. Thank you, Cecily. Congratulations. Thank Thanks. you. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Nick. <laughs>